Hello, uh, my name is Jared Boone. Uh, I design open source hardware for a living, believe it or not. And I want to introduce more people to hardware um, so that maybe some of, some of you can start working on hardware uh, on your own. Uh, I've been involved to varying degrees in some open source hardware projects. Uh, this is a product I've sold for a couple of years now that's uh, called the Cronulator, a uh, simple clock that's great for learning how to solder. Uh, I've also worked on a bunch of other people's projects, um, mostly related to wireless security. This is a um, Bluetooth uh, testing tool called Ubertooth. Uh, I contributed to the hardware and code on this software-defined radio called HackRF. And I'm doing a bunch of hardware design on a new project called Dyshow, which is another security-focused tool for evaluating high-speed communications like uh, USB, super speed, uh, HDMI, and gigabit ethernet. Um, those last three security-related projects are the brain children of Mike Osman, who will be speaking at this conference tomorrow um, at 1.30, I believe, about his HackRF radio and how you, too, can play with radio technology, even if you have no hardware experience. I, on the other hand, want to give you a little bit of hardware experience by building on your software experience by taking apart this thing. This is Robotron 2084. Uh, it was, it's an arcade game that was released in 1982, back when most video games were the kind you drop quarters into. Uh, it's built into a giant wooden cabinet and has excellent graphics plastered all over the outside of it. Uh, has a big cathode ray tube display. Um, chances are some of you may have never actually had to use one of those <laughs> giant CRTs. Uh, it has two joysticks and it has an integrated speaker for sound effects. Uh, the graphics are pretty clunky by modern standards, but Robotron is proof that great gameplay can transcend hardware limitations. The backstory of the game is that the Robotrons are robots that evolve to the point that they see humans as an inefficient and naturally conclude that they must be destroyed. Your job as the mutant savior is to destroy the robots and save the last human family from destruction. In this video, Jason demonstrates how this is done. Uh, this is a machine over at Ground Control, which happens to also be the shirt I'm wearing today. Uh, if you should ever feel the need to kill some Robotrons yourself, it's about 10 blocks uh, north and northeast. We'll uh, admire for a second his awesome gameplay strategy here. I think you even say as much. Okay. So, uh, Robotron was designed for Williams Electronics by this guy, um, Eugene Jarvis, and another guy named Larry DeMar, who had a company, uh, consulting company called VidKids. Uh, this is him in 2006. Uh, their handiwork consists of four giant circuit boards. This thing's about this big, about, I don't know, 18 inches by a foot. Huge. Um, and so there are four boards like this inside the, the game cabinet. Uh, this is the largest one. It con connects to the video monitor and a couple of the other boards. Uh, let's look at a, a labeling. Here's the part where my mouse starts to fall apart. <laughs> let's look at the labeling on some of the chips and see if we can't Google them and find out more about them. So the big chip on the left is the Motorola MC6809E microprocessor unit. Uh, it's an 8-bit microprocessor. The 24 chips on the upper right-hand side are MK4116 16 kilobit dynamic RAM chips. If you stop and think for a second, 16 kilobits for each chip. That's 48 kilobytes, which is about, I don't know, 500,000 times less RAM than I have in my laptop, <laughs> roughly. So it sounds like this computer contains an 8-bit computer with 48K of memory. We could be describing this classic computer, the Radio Shack Color Computer. It's also built on a Motorola 6809 processor and came with roughly the same amount of memory. Robotron is built very much like the computers of the day, but has some special hardware which makes it much better for implementing video games. Here's another smaller board that attaches to the large board via a gray ri ribbon cable in the upper right-hand corner. It attaches to another small board via the top left connector and to the coin acceptors via the bottom left connector. Twelve of these chips have labels that say ROM. They're uniquely numbered from 1 to 12, so it's safe to conclude that these must be the read-only memory where the program code for the game is stored. There's a MC6821 peripheral interface adapter next to the connectors on the left. This is the third board. It connects to the last board by a cable and also attaches to an audio speaker. There's three interesting chips here. The 6802 is another 8-bit microprocessor. 
the MC6810 is 128 bytes of RAM, and there's a ROM for code. Uh, there's also another of the per peripheral interface adapter chips. So it seems like we have another 8-bit computer on this board. And it may be responsible for sound effects because it has a speaker connection and also has a chip that's explicitly labeled video sound ROM. This is the last board. It connects to the big board via a, another gray ribbon cable. There are two connectors along the top edge that attach to the joysticks. If we look under the purple label on the chip on the right, uh, we'll find yet another of those peripheral interface adapters. So this chip must interface the joysticks and the buttons to the rest of the system. Here's a diagram of what we've learned so far about the four boards and how they, how they interconnect. Uh, it seems like we've got two distinct computers in the machine. There's the computer or the processor in the top left that connects to a bunch of ROM in the board on the bottom left. And then we've got what looks to be another complete computer in the bottom right hand corner with a RAM, ROM, and a processor. So the, the big board evidently does the video and interfaces with the joysticks and the coin slots, and the other computer must generate the sound effects. This is, the, this is one of five pages of schematics for the Robotron game. Robotron was made back when uh, circuit boards and chips were large and easy to repair using common tools, and the electronics weren't quite as reliable as they are today. So it made sense for the manufacturer, Williams, to publish uh, a repair manual that had the complete schematics. Here's the 6809 processor that we found earlier by looking at the boards. The 6809 is the 1982 equivalent of an ARM or Intel or AMD processor. It runs a program step by step from machine language instructions located in memory. The program instructs the processor to modify the program state by reading and writing variables stored in the memory. If we look at the 6809 processor, we can see that the chip has 16 address pins labeled A0 through A15. Uh, eight D signals, labeled D0 through D7, and a read and write signal. These are the signals that interface to the memory and the peripherals. If we follow the, the address signals coming from the chip and see where they connect, we'll find that all of the memory and we'll find all of the memory and peripherals that are reachable from this microprocessor. The address bus goes to the board with the ROM chips on it, which would make sense if the game's code was stored in that ROM. Some of the address bus bits also go to the joystick board. The address bus also goes to the second page of the CPU schematic where it connects to a 48k byte bank of RAM, of RAM chips. That's the big group of RAM chips that we looked at earlier on the board. Here's a diagram of what we know about the CPU board so far. The processor and RAM are both connected to the address bus, and the address bus goes off to the ROM board. Back to the schematic, we'll take a look and see where the data bus goes. Uh, data bus also goes to the ROM board. The widget board, which was the, uh, the interface board that connects to the joysticks, and to page, page two of the CPU board schematic. On page two of the CPU board schematic, surprise, surprise, the data bus also goes to the 48K memory bank. So I added in the data bus here to this diagram. Let's look around elsewhere on the schematic and see what else the address and data buses connect to. This is a RAM chip that's not part of that 48K bank. Uh, it's a 1K by 4 RAM. Here's the first page of the data sheet for that particular chip. And here's some pseudocode for how the uh, chip would behave. I've, I've got my own special pseudocode that um, corresponds a little bit better to how hardware works. Hopefully you can make sense of my, my code. Um, I've declared a chunk of code up at the top, which says there's a RAM that's 1K by 4 um, bits in, in, in size. And then there's a process which executes constantly, um, just keeps looping and looping and looping that same chunk of code. And if the right signal is true, the data that comes, the data in some variable gets written into an address in that RAM array. If the right, if a right variable is false, the value of whatever is in the RAM array currently gets put onto the data variable. So does that make some amount of sense? Here's the part where we get, we get out of like, where I have to start making the analogy between software and hardware. So if, if uh, 
at any point it starts to get a little bit confusing or fuzzy, just pipe up, let me know. I'm, I have lots of extra time in this talk, so <laughs> go ahead. Uh, you have a good point. Yeah, it should be like, um, yeah, print data. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. That's a, yeah, good catch. Yep. Yeah, so in, in pseudocode, basically, I'm, I'm modifying a bunch of variables that this process operates on. So I set the right flag to one, and the address and data variables to 22 and 30, 13, respectively. And at that point, the data winds up getting written into the RAM array. Uh, I then set right to zero and change the address, or actually I don't change the address, but I read out the value that's at address 22, and lo and behold, it's 13. So there's a, a battery attached to this chip. Um, if the machine loses power, the data in the, the memory chip will be preserved. So it's safe to assume this is where the high scores and the configuration for the game are stored. Um, in an arcade back in the day, th these machines would draw hundreds of watts each, and it, it made financial sense to turn them off at night so that uh, you weren't burning a lot of power during the 12 hours that the arcade was closed. And more importantly, your high score will still be there in the morning. Here's another chunk of circuitry connected to the processor address and data buses. It has a telling bit of text right there in the middle. It says watchdog disable. This must be the hardware watchdog circuit for the, for the game. Uh, a hardware watchdog circuit is a circuit that will reset the game if something goes wrong. A common way to do this is by writing your application code so that it periodically resets a timer. The code causes the timer to reset by writing a specific piece of data to a specific memory address. If this isn't done by the time the timer reaches a timeout value, then the watchdog circuit resets the processor, reboots the entire system on the assumption that the programs crash somehow. Of course, this is long before operating systems and exception handling and all that stuff. This whole game had only 48K worth of worth of memory, so you're not going to be booting any precursor to Linux on it. Uh, th again, this is pseudocode to kind of try and describe that. Um, uh, the top block, the process watchdog timer, the first line says, says is it essentially blocks until this watchdog timer clock variable experiences an event. So it's like waiting on a signal. And once that signal occurs, it executes the rest of that block. Uh, it tests to see whether the watchdog timer is equal to the timeout count. If it is, reset the processor. If it's not, don't reset the processor, but instead increment the watchdog timer count by one and then repeat the whole thing over again. So the, the watchdog timer, because of that first line, that wait for line, is proceeding, forming the, the, that, that, other, that block underneath at the rate that these watchdog timer clock events are sent. So that's what's ultimately determining how fast the watchdog timer advances. The Does it run on a separate one of those CPUs? Like what's, what are we noticing as What's that? What, so we are, we are resetting the watchdog CPU if the main CPU hasn't been? Right. So if, if the main CPU gets caught in a loop somehow, um, that, that was kind of the failure mode in 1982 was, you know, the code something would go wrong and the thing would run off and execute a bunch of code that it wasn't supposed to, it would jump somewhere and, and start executing video memory or something. Um, and it would not get around to resetting this timer in a, in a orderly fashion, you know, within five milliseconds or whatever the time frame was. And so if the processor doesn't get around to doing that, this piece of hardware described by this loop, this is not describing a loop in, in the software running on the processor, this is actually describing a piece of hardware that's on the circuit board that's performing this task. So this is the watchdog itself? Right. Okay. Yeah, it's the circuit that was on a couple of pages ago and that we're going to get back to here in a second and, and tease apart. Um, so is everyone following me at this point? Okay. No shame in saying no. <laughs> okay. Um, so the second process block describes another piece of hardware which notices if the processor, the 8-bit the microprocessor that runs the game code, is attempting to write a particular address with a particular piece of data. And if it's doing so, resets the watchdog timer counter to zero, thus preventing the whole system from getting reset. Uh, and then down at the bottom, you would have in the code that actually runs on the microprocessor itself, periodically you would execute some line of code that would write that watchdog reset value into memory at the watchdog address. 
so this is the, back to the, the schematic, this is the block of the schematic that represents the watchdog timer. And we're going to focus on the bit here on the right first. Um, on the right side is some decoding logic, which checks the address and data buses for specific watchdog values. I'll work through the logic in a moment, but first I need to detour and explain these symbols and what they mean. Um, you're all, of course, familiar with Boolean logic. If you've done any kind of software development, it's, of course, the first thing that you, practically the first thing that you learn. Uh, but in electronic uh, schematics, different logic types, ands, ors, nots, have different symbols that are shaped in different ways. So this is an and symbol, uh, an or symbol. Uh, this is an exclusive or, which doesn't have an analog in any programming languages I'm familiar with. Um, but test essentially if, if the inputs are not equal. And if the inputs are not equal, the output is true. This is a, a not symbol, which is essentially a, a, an inverter. Um, it, in, in, in electrical engineering terms, it's called an inverter, but it's, it's basically a not operation. And the circle on the end of the symbol there is what tells you that it inverts. Taking that concept forward, we have what looks to be an AND gate, but it has a circle on the output. And what that means is that it acts like an AND gate, but the outputs, which would have been one for an AND gate, are now zero and vice versa. So it's now a NAND gate. And same thing applies here. We've got a, a NOR that's made out of an OR with an inversion on the output. So back to the schematic, we see that we've got two NOR gates. The shape of the symbol represents an OR function. So I'm just putting in placeholders here, X and Y, for the, the variables that represent the inputs to those, those functions. Um, we've got a circle on the output. So that means that the output is inverted. So there's a not, um, a not behavior that's applied to the result of the OR process. And each of those two NOR gates or NOR functions are taking inputs from the data bus. Uh, in the case of the one on the top, it's taking data bus bits one and two, and the bottom one's taking data bits six and seven. Uh, we have a, a NOT function down here at the bottom, which just inverts the value of the signal going into it, which I'm not going to go into details, is coming from another portion of the schematic, which happens to be testing the high, six, the high eight bits of the address bus against the hexadecimal value C8. Uh, the two wrongs make a right, I can cancel the two knots out and we're just left with a, a simple comparison of those eight address bits. Here's an AND function that's combining the output of the knot and one of the address bits, uh, address bit one. Uh, the other input comes from that address comparison that we saw a couple slides ago. All of those functions flow into this NAND function here along with a whole bunch of other address and data bits. So we'll take the two NOR functions and substitute them into this. Yay, fancy animations. Just about the only animations you're going to get because, yeah. And then the uh, address comparison down here at the bottom from this AND gate goes into the bottom input on that NAND function. And lastly, there's a whole bunch of direct, oops, direct connections to other address and data pins. The output of that NAND gate goes into a NOR gate, but you'll notice both inputs are wired together. Um, if you wire, in, wire together the inputs of a NOR gate, they both have the same value. They're both going to be one or they're both going to be zero. And the net effect of that is you've created yourself an inverter. But why would you do that? Uh, the hardware designer did this because logic functions usually come in multiples per chip. For a NOR function, you usually get four of them in one chip. The designer needed one more inverter but didn't have an, a, a free inverter in one of the chips that was already on the board. So what they did is they took an extra NOR, wired its inputs together, and turned it into an inverter. Uh, in doing so, the designer avoided adding another inverter chip to the design. So think of this as like compiler optimization except designing hardware. A kind of reverse optimization where you're not trying to remove 
things, but you're trying to just take advantage of, of physical bits that you already have on the circuit board. So with the additional not applied to the equation, we have this as our watchdog address and data decoder. The two knots at the top cancel out, and this equation determines if the processor is trying to reset the watchdog timer. If this chunk of logic detects that the processor is trying to write a specific address with a specific data value, the equation will become true, and the watchdog timer will re reset them, or will prevent the machine from being reset. So let's substitute some of the values to figure out what will make the equation on the left be true. At the outermost level, all of the values are being added together. So to make the equation as a whole true, each of the individual and uh, arguments have to be true. And that means on the right that D0 has to be 1, D3 has to be 1, D4 has to be 1, and on and on and on. And the three more complex equations also have to evaluate to 1 somehow. So the test for A8 through 15, the second to last line there, equals, so there's that equality, and there's also a test for A1 equals 1, and those were being added together. We need to spread those out into two separate ands. We can flip the truth on the two NOR equations, removing the not that was before the, the D1 and the D6, and instead compare it to 0 instead of 1. So you take out the not and you compare it to 0 instead of 1, you've st still got basically the same logic. Did, does that make sense? Okay. Uh, from this, we can stick together the possible combinations and figure out what the watchdog address is. Uh, because A0, the lowest bit of the address, isn't checked, that means that it could be either a 0 or a 1. So the watchdog logic will respond at two different addresses, C8FE or C8FF hex. As for the data, we can do the same thing. Uh, for D6 or D7 to be 0, that means both D6 and D7 must be 0. Uh, if either D6 or D7 are 1, then the OR would evaluate to 1, and that equation wouldn't, wouldn't be true. So we can conclude that the watchdog reset data value is 39 hex. Uh, so here's the system architecture updated with the watchdog timer. Uh, you can see that it listens to the address and data buses and controls the reset signal going into the processor. Time for a drink. Okay, so next let's look at the video system. This is a kind of a complicated system, but I think, I think it'll make sense. Um, but first, a quick refresher on how analog video signals work. Pixels are scanned out to a video display one pixel at a time over three color channels. The horizontal sync tells the video display when a row of pixels has ended and to move back to the left side of the screen, much like a carriage return or a line feed in, in a terminal. Uh, the vertical sync tells the video display when to start a new screen full of pixels. On most displays, this happens at 60 frames a second, or 60 times a second. So here's the red, green, blue, and horizontal sync and vertical sync signals on the CPU board. So you could conclude that this is the video output. Let's trace back from those signals and see how the video hardware works. The red, green, and blue signals carry the pixel colors to the monitor as a video frame is scanned out for display 60 times a second. The signals come through three transistors which buffer the output of three resistor ladders, one for each, one for each color channel. Resistor ladders are a simple form of digital to analog conver converter. Uh, you can see that we've got three bits or three resistors being allocated to the red channel, three bits or three resistors being allocated to the green, and only two to the blue channel. In total we have eight bits of color depth which is of course a far cry from the 24-bit color depth we're accustomed to on modern computers. This is very 80s. Continuing to work back from the uh, pixel resistor ladders, we see two memory chips, very, very small memory chips, 64 bits in fact, organized as an array of 16 by 4. Two of these RAM chips are wired up into a 16 by 4 by 2 arrangement for an effective array size of 16 by 8 bits. The eight data outputs of these memory chips are wired to the RGB color channels, and eight data inputs are connected to the processor's data bus. The address input, or the index into the memory, array, uh, the memory array, if you'd like to think of it that way, comes from a memory bank on the other page of the CPU schematic. 
Uh, at this point, it's safe to say that the display image lives in a buffer in the 48K memory bank, and that these two little memory chips are providing a lookup table, turning 4-bit pixel values into 8-bit RGB colors. In other words, this is a color table or color palette memory. The processor can modify the color palette to change the RGB color that a palette index corresponds to, and this is what gives Robotron its crazy palette animation effects. Modern computers without palette lookup tables would have to redraw virtually the entire screen to, re to achieve these epilepsy-inducing color effects. But with Robotron's palette-based graphics system, the processor just rewrites 16 bytes worth of uh, palette RAM for each video frame, and the animation is achieved. So, how does the pixel data get from the 48K memory bank to the color palette memory? It comes from the other schematic sheet, four bits at a time, as signals serial zero through serial three. These four bits come from this circuit, which is made up of four 74166 chips. Each bit is an eight-bit shift register. Uh, these shift registers take bytes and turn them into a stream of bits. In pseudocode, this is how an eight-bit shift register might look. Uh, the shift register only does work when a clock event occurs, kind of like the prior example I showed you. Uh, and when a clock event occurs, it checks to see if the load variable is true. And if it is, it loads the register value from an input variable. If it's not true, the register shifted right one bit. And at all times, the output of the shift register is the least significant bit in, in the uh, register, the, the value variable. So how are these shift registers connected? There's four of them, and they're chained together so that, or actually they're not chained together, sorry. They're, um, they're taking input fr uh, from the memory bank 24 bits at a time. That's what happens when I go off script. Uh, the 24 bits are then doled out one bit at a time from each of the four shift registers into the color palette memory. There's a clock signal going into the shift registers that controls how fast the bits are shifted out of the shift registers. Elsewhere in the schematic, the clock is shown to be 6 megahertz. So to sum up the bit, this bit of the circuit, the pixel data is read from memory 24 bits at a time at a rate of 1 megahertz and loaded into shift registers. The shift registers serialize the data to produce four bits at a time, or one pixel at a time, at a rate of six megahertz. But why this complicated arrangement with shift registers? Couldn't you just read the hardware or the, the pixels two at a time from memory at a rate of three megahertz and do away with the shift registers? Uh, of course, it's not so easy back in 1982. Uh, let's have a look at the data sheet for the RAM chips that are in that memory array. You can see that this chip takes 150 nanoseconds to 200 nanoseconds to access data, depending upon whether you buy the faster or the slower version of the chip. Just like DDR3 memory speeds in modern computers, fast memory chips in 1982 commanded a premium price. Uh, in fact, designers specified a much older model of this chip that took 450 nanoseconds to access data. So how many accesses per second can four, a 450 nanosecond memory chip perform? A whopping 2.2 million. Remember how we need to read 3 million bytes a second from memory to read to have a video pixel output rate of 6 million pixels a second? 450 nanoseconds just isn't going to do it. Add to that the problem that the memory is being shared with the processor. The processor has a 1 megahertz clock cycle and needs to access the memory up to a million times a second. So we need a combined memory bandwidth of 4 million bytes a second for both the video and the processor components. So this is why the hardware designers made the memory bank three bytes wide instead of one byte and added the shift registers for pixel data. If the memory access is take 450 nanoseconds, but you're reading three bytes a time at a time instead of just one, your aggregate bandwidth is 6.7 million bytes per second, enough to satisfy the combined 4 million bytes per second that the video hardware and the processor require. While we're on the subject of video hardware, I should tell you about the cocktail uh, cabinet versions of Robotron. These are cabinets that are built like tables. Uh, two players, or in this case three, sit on uh, opposite ends of the machine with a screen in between, and they play two-player games against each other. Uh, I suppose it goes without saying that the image on the screen needs to flip upside down for player two to be able to play the game. And 
due to a quirk in the presentation software. I can't just go forward through the slide without playing through to the end. Oh, come on. I'm still a bit of a noob when it comes to Keynote. There we go. Okay, so earlier I conveniently ignored the fact that there's a second set of pixel shift registers next to the ones we just discussed. But there's a subtle difference. The bits that are coming from the memory bank are connected to the bottom shift registers in a different order from the top, reversing the order of the pairs of pixels. Instead of the pixel order being one, two, three, four, five, six, they come out in an order that's two, one, four, three, six, five. Very, very interesting. So we'll, we'll dig in a little bit further here and notice that the two sets of pixel shift registers flow into a two to one selector. This chip switches between two groups of four bits each. Uh, or, in this case, between the two different pixel outputs from the shift registers. Um, there's a mysterious signal called screen control that you can see in the lower right corner that uh, appears to do the switching between the top and the bottom pixel shift registers. So let's look around elsewhere on the schematic and see where else the screen control signal pops up. So here it is on the first page of the CPU board schematic where it goes off to the ROM board but it also goes into two chips. They're both the same kind of chip, a 74, six, or sorry, 7641. Each chip is a 512 byte programmable read-only memory. So it's not a RAM, it's a ROM that comes burnt at the factory with a specific bunch of code. Oh, microphone's getting crazy. Here. The PROM chip on the left is connected between the processor address bus and something labeled a pseudo address bus. The pseudo address bus goes to the 48K memory bank where the video frame buffer and the game runtime state lives. The PROM on the right is connected between the 48K memory bank and the video pixel counter which keeps track of the video pixel being sent to the display at that instant in time. The screen control comes into one of the address lines on each PROM chip. So what is it doing? The two chips work in concert to change the order the pixels are written into memory and the order in which they're read from memory when they're being scanned onto the display. By changing the screen control signal, the image on the screen will reverse without any additional effort from the processor. Why do this? It's basically the same answer as, as the shift registers before. Um, it's, it's performance. The processor runs at one megahertz and executes 300,000 instructions a second if you're lucky. Uh, of course, modern processors execute billions of instructions per second. The processor just doesn't have time to do the extra math to reverse the coordinates when it's drawing uh, to flip the X and the Y axis in the image. And there's no fancy modern GPU chip in, the, in Robotron to do the job for the processor. So the designer solved the problem with a simple bit of hardware that alters the way memory is addressed and the way that it's read out and is completely transparent to the processor. So I've touched on most of the interesting stuff on the board, uh, on the CPU board. So let's look at the sound board. Recall that we found all the chips required to make a full computer, a 8-bit microprocessor, a RAM chip, some ROM. Um, so we, we've got a, a, a full computer here, it appears. There's also a connection to the ROM board. Uh, the processor on the CPU board apparently controls the sound board through this interface. There's the microprocessor there, the Motorola 6802. The 128-byte memory, which believe it or not, was enough back then to store the state of the code that runs on this particular board. The ROM chip, which is where the code is stored. And yet another of those peripheral interface adapters. Connected to the peripheral interface adapter is an MC1408 chip, which is connected to the speaker and a volume control. And it looks like the 1408 is an 8-bit digital analog converter. So this must be the audio output, and the computer on the soundboard must be essentially an 8-bit digital audio synthesizer, just running code on that little 1 megahertz 8-bit processor. This is the uh, Williams Special Chip 1, which is worthy of a talk all by itself, so I'm going to skip it this time. Um, Maybe next year I'll, I'll do reverse engineering of the actual chip photo because uh, there's really cool open source software to do that. Um, and I'd really love to try it sometime. 
And this is a, a, actually a fairly basic chip by, by integrated circuit standards. So this is the 1982 equivalent of a GPU. It was designed to move pixels around in memory without the involvement of the main processor. Uh, since the 6809 processor can only execute a few hundred thousand instructions per second, it needs help moving pixels fast enough to implement the game. And that's what this chip is there for. Has that been fully reversed yet? Uh, not at the chip level, but this is a photo that Sean Riddle himself yeah. somehow procured. So I'm, I'm optimistic that Even someone, yeah, well, I would love to do it if I find the time. It would be a lot of fun. <laughs> Uh, so there are actually a pair of these chips on the ROM board of each Robotron machine that are commanded by the processor to do the bulk of the graphics and animation, including copying bitmap font images from ROM to video memory. So all the fonts, all the text that you've seen is actually drawn from ROM one character at a time with the assistance of these chips. Uh, I'm also going to skip the rest of the ROM board because frankly it's quite boring. Um, there's just 12 ROM chips and interface to the coin acceptors and the sound board. I'm also going to skip the interface board because there's not much of note. It just serves as an interface to the joysticks and the, power, uh, the player buttons. So what was the point of all this? Um, besides having fodder for a talk at Open Source Bridge, um, I wanted to recreate the game, but not as software. Uh, that's already been done by software like MAME, the multi-arcade machine emulator. But it's not a very literal simulation. It doesn't try too hard to act like the actual hardware. I wanted to recreate the game using the actual schematics and a real 6809 processor. To do this, I used a field programmable gate array, or FPGA chip, which I like to describe as stem cells for silicon. Uh, an FPGA is like any other chip, except it's not wired to do anything in particular. Instead, you load your own wiring into a, into a matrix on the chip that connects the chip's logic in whatever way you want. Uh, an FPGA could act like a microprocessor, a video card, a Bitcoin miner, uh, music synthesizer, high-speed data encryptor, radar data processing system, uh, or simulate video game hardware. An FPGA isn't executing code, it's acting exactly like the chips on the schematic, and therefore it has the potential to be a more accurate recreation of the game. I did cop out on one thing though, I didn't want to try and recreate the 6809 processor in the FPGA. It was just too much of a challenge for my FPGA skills. Uh, which I'm hoping will improve to the point where I can try, it, try doing this. But instead I created an interface board so that I could plug a real 6809 into the FPGA board and avoid that work. In retrospect, I kind of like the fact that there's still uh, a real original chip in my project. Uh, it makes it just that much more real and vintage and cool. Why do you think there isn't an open core for that? There are open cores for it, they're just not cycle accurate and because of the way little side note on, on the Williams Special Chip 1, the graphics processing chips. The microprocessors back in the day were so slow that they didn't fully utilize memory. There, there were times where they had to do work inside the chip and had to just, just do that work and not keep the memory fully utilized. In which case, there were spare memory cycles that the Special Chip 1s could steal to do the graphics work. So, you know, the RAM in Robotron is fully utilized by either the processor, or if the processor's not using it, the graphics chips will step in and use those spare cycles. So how do you describe to an FPGA how you want it to act? Uh, you use a hardware description language, or HDL. There are two major languages, BHDL and Verilog. Uh, it looks a lot like software, but it's not. Uh, in HDL, the code you write turns into actual bits of hardware, circuitry that performs exactly the task you described. And because all these circuits operate simultaneously, you've got a great, a great platform for doing massively parallel processing tasks, like Bitcoin mining. Uh, as I studied the schematic, I implemented the circuitry I found by describing it in HDL code. There were a few missteps along the way. The most visible were when I was trying to understand how the video hardware worked. You can still kind of see the game in there somewhere, but it, this was back when I didn't quite understand that the video was actually stored not row by row by row, but column by column by column in, in RAM. And so I was, it's essentially being rendered 90 degrees, turn 90 degrees to the right. But eventually I figured it out and I got a playable machine. This is a, a guy at Maker Faire in San Mateo uh, about a month ago who knows the proper way to play Robotron. On your knees. 
Um, there, so I'm going to have some links here in fact, right there, last slide. That um, the first link is a guy named Sean Riddle who is way more obsessed about old video games than I am and has done some pretty amazing work reverse engineering uh, a lot of the Williams games of the era. It turns out that um, Defender, Joust, Sinistar, they're all based on the same basic hardware platform. And so he, he spent a lot of time digging into them and documenting them, including the special chip one. Um, I also cheated at that point because there's no schematic really for the chip itself and looked at the main source code to better understand how I might emulate the special chip one, even though, because there just wasn't enough like hardware level information for me to emulate it at a hardware level. But hopefully with that chip photo, I may be able to reverse it, the, or someone will be able to reverse the chip to the extent where I could actually implement it literally in hardware without having to make some, some guesses. So yeah, this is, um, the, the first link is all of the, this amazing documentation, very technical on the, the Williams games of the era. Uh, I put all of the HDL code for my Robotron work up on GitHub. And uh, lastly, you should visit Church of Robotron, where you can be fully indoctrinated into the cult of Robotron. And uh, with that, I will ask for questions. Are there, um, are there efforts to get these companies to use documentation of their old I don't know that there is. With Williams in particular, it's really complicated because they've been bought and sold so many times. I'm not even sure if they're still in business at this point, but they were, were getting passed around like every few years. And the chain of ownership on that stuff is probably pretty murky at this point. Um, for what it's worth, uh, I kind of, as far as like copyright issues are concerned, I have my get out of free, jail free card because I bought a real Robotron ROM board on eBay, eBay that I am very proud of, that has a copy of the source or the the uh, executable for the game right on the board. So uh, that's that's my cover. The schematics were readily available. Yeah, yeah, because they're published in in uh, service manuals, and you know technically I think the service manuals are probably probably under copyright, but how long does that extend and? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard to know what the chain of ownership of the company is whether there's really any legally enforceable situation there. Bart. So a couple questions. It's a second sixty eight hundred based processor. It's not a full blown sixty eight oh nine. The sixty eight oh nine is is essentially an extension of the sixty eight hundred microprocessor which came around a few years earlier, but it's a bit faster. Um, the sixty eight Yeah, well, so I, I, for that one, I used an open core that was available. And I don't think it's cycle accurate either. But when I ran it, ran the sound code on it, it sounded like the game. And so I was like, OK, I'm done. That was, that was my second question. I mean, for people who are building something, they feel like it's identical. OK, so that, that's another caveat. Is um, back, back to your question about the uh, special chip ones. My implementation, there is something wrong. Because when. People were playing it at Maker Faire. They were kicking ass. Because what, what was happening is something about the way that I'm sharing um, uh, memory cycles between the processor and the blitter chip, the special chip one, something's wrong. And I'm ch starving the graphics chips for cycles. And so the, gra the animation slows down when you get a lot of stuff on screen all at once. And it makes the game easier. So that's another re reason why I'm kind of motivated to reverse this chip is that if I can get something that's a more literal representation of that chip, it should be more accurate um, than what I have now, which is clearly not right when you get to wave four, wave five, and stuff just starts grinding down to maybe 80, 85% of normal speed. Yeah, well, that's, it's, I mean, you're building a computer from pretty much just you know, sticks and stones pretty much, relative to what we do now, which is we've got complete chipsets with all the peripherals integrated. I mean, it, it has a completely different set of challenges where you've got these amazingly high-speed buses where you've got to get data back and forth at tens of gigabits a second um, across, you know, a couple inches, which as far as electricity is concerned is like light years, literally light years. Um, 
it's, it's still an amazing feat. It's just a very different practice than what it was in 1982. Yes, uh, and if I were to go back and look at the date code, you'll see it looks like it was manufactured in the 13th week of 2009. So they're still cranking them out. Um, in fact, um, I hacked a reader board for a friend of mine. We got used in the Church of Robotron installation at uh, Tour Camp last year. And when I cracked it open, I found a 6800 based microprocessor in it that was on a circuit board that was designed in 1999. Um, the unit was sold in 2000. So they were still designing new products around the 6800 processor series in the year 2000. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so there's some, some chips that wind up getting used in military space applications that need to be that need to go through a much higher level of, of qualification than consumer products do. And that, of course, is expensive. And so they make sure that they, they basically guarantee the supply. If, if the customer will agree to a long-term contract, they guarantee a supply of these chips for, yeah, decades. So that may be part of the reason why you can buy these chips. You can still buy these brand new. Uh, a company called Jameco in, in the Bay Area sells them uh, mail order. I used to buy stuff from them in the 80s. Um, they're still around and they're still selling old stuff, new stuff, and that's where I bought these, these chips. I mean, if you want uh, literally pennies, slow-buck, into the it's not a terrible chip. I mean, it's Well, no, except that now you can buy for a buck and change, you can buy a 32-bit ARM processor that runs t 20 times as fast as it and has built-in RAM and ROM. Mm, with packages that large, they're probably not. They're, and, and huge dyes. Yeah. Right. Okay, well, I'm two minutes past time, so I should, suppose I should split. Thank you.